I will be talking about uh, ultra short UV pulses um, and how we generate them and uh, and some of the characteristics of them and uh, and some plans of what we're going to use them for. Um, so first I'll just introduce uh, my group. So I, I run the Laboratory of Ultrafast Physics and Optics at Harriet Watt University. Um, and that's a university doesn't have the name of the city that we're in uh, in the title. So it's often confusing to people where we're from. So we're from Scotland and uh, we're based in Edinburgh, just in the outskirts of Edinburgh. And a lot of what I'm going to be showing today, well, all of what I'm going to be showing today um, is only possible because of my um, excellent group, which I uh, show you here. This is a pre-pandemic. Uh, this was Christmas pre-pandemic, so this is a, a while ago now. Um, but uh, hopefully these good days will return at some point. Um, and all of these people are involved in the work that I'm going to be discussing um, uh, today. So I'm going to be talking about generating few femtosecond pulses in the deep ultraviolet and the vacuum ultraviolet. Um, so just to remind you um, what we're talking about here, um, the deep ultraviolet, um, everyone has their own definition, but I mean two to 300 nanometers. Um, in fact, the sources we, we use can generate up all the way to the infrared. So the upper limit doesn't really matter. And then also into the vacuum ultraviolet region down to around about 100 nanometers. So why, why do we want to do this? So there are lots of reasons for generating ultra short UV pulses. Um, here I'm just going to show you the key ones that we're actually working on. Um, so a lot of molecular systems and also um, some atoms have their electronic uh, resonances in the vacuum ultraviolet and deep ultraviolet region. And so there um, you need ultra short UV pulses in order to excite these systems and study them in, for example, time resolved spectroscopy. I think there will be quite a few talks um, throughout this school, which are going to be describing experiments exactly like that, where you excite a system, you let it evolve for some time, and then you probe it at some later point and, uh, and learn the dynamics of the system in this way. It's also um, important for the same reason to excite molecules, for example, for imaging experiments. So, for example, X-ray imaging experiments on free electron lasers, um, you often excite some sort of molecular system, it will evolve, maybe it will fragment or, or break apart. And then by using X-ray imaging, um, you can look at the actual dynamics of the structure um, as the system evolves. So there's some lots of key fundamental applications of deep and vacuum ultraviolet sources. We're also looking at applying them to healthcare applications. So there's a, we have a very large new project um, to generate UV light um, for specific healthcare applications. This is very exciting. I'm not going to talk about this today, um, but uh, but it's 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 I'm excited about it because being an academic that's worked a lot on fundamental applications of the sources, it's interesting to do something that actually might get out of the lab and solve real world problems. They can be used to excite electron sources, um, for example, uh, on the photocathodes that in inject the electrons into um, accelerators. Um, and we also worked with some uh, key players in the semiconductor industry for both metrology and, uh, and analysis of uh, uh, semiconductor fabrication. So there's lots of applications. These are the ones we're working on. Uh, I'm sure there are many, many others. Um, and for these applications, what we want are tunable source across this whole range. So we don't want to be restricted to individual wavelengths within this range. We want to be able to tune all the way across continuously, depending on whatever system we're going to be looking at studying. Um, we want really short pulses, um, and this is just to probe the fastest dynamics. Some of the dynamics in, in small molecules, for example, is sub 10 femtoseconds. And if you want to access these, then you need um, extremely short pulses in order to, to get the resolution in your experiment. And we want good energy just because it's always hard to measure these things. You want a decent amount of energy in order to see these. Um, and unless you want to continuously use very, very large laser systems, you, this implies you want high efficiency. So there have been quite a lot of attempts to get to the deep and vacuum ultraviolet region 
Um, and um, I will re briefly review them now just to see how they compare to what we're doing. I don't want to trample on everyone's work, right? I mean, these sources are key and important for a lot of applications, um, but none of them actually meet all of our criteria. Um, and that's what I'm going to go on and talk about in a moment. Um, but perhaps I would say the widest used route to the deep ultraviolet is to use parametric processes in crystals. So these types of sources were um, reviewed this morning by Rothio in her in her talk um, earlier on. Um, and basically through a variety of techniques, um, most widely used is to pump a, a NOPA in the visible and then frequency double it or use some frequency generation. But there are also other routes, for example, cascaded uh, generation of third harmonic. Um, you can generate tunable sources in the deep ultraviolet region. Um, and uh, this is nice because it's quite an accessible um, technology. Um, you can get pretty short pulses. So, you know, if the, you can get sub 10 femtoseconds if you work hard enough, um, but it's, it's going to be really challenging to get three femtoseconds or two femtoseconds. Um, and it's, it's not really possible to go to the VUV. And this is just because of limitations to the crystal material, right? So they, the crystals absorb uh, below uh, around about 200, 190 nanometers. There are very exotic, very difficult to grow crystals that can be produced that do generate in the VUV. Um, they're not widely established. So it's possible that such a such crystals could enable these sorts of sources into the VUV in the future. Um, but as, as it stands, it's not very easy to tune uh, crystal-based parametric sources much shorter than about 200 nanometers. On the other hand, another quite simple from a from a high level picture approach is low and high harmonic generation. So I think you will hear quite a lot about high harmonic generation over the next few days, um, where you can generate EUV and XUV photons um, quite readily. Um, but you can also use sort of low harmonic or moderate harmonic. So we're talking about third harmonic and fifth harmonic generation just in a gas. So you just focus your pulse into um, either a cell or a capillary or, a, or whatever that involves your gas. And by tuning the pressure and the energy, for example, you can actually optimize this to get really short pulses. Um, so this paper by Galli, um, they produced sub two femtosecond pulses in this way. Um, and this can be working at the seventh harmonic as well. Um, so this is a great technique. You can get to the VUV and EUV. Um, the pulses can be really short, um, but it's it basically dumps the the effort to make the tunability on making a tunable pump source. Um, and in order to get these short pulses that I talk about, these sub two femtoseconds, you needed to pump with very short pulses. And these very short pulses are then quite hard to tune themselves. So it's not going to make it very easy to get a tunable source across the VUV and EUV region. Um, and the other downside is that it has very low efficiency. Um, that's fine if you have a huge amount of resources and a big laser lab um, and you can just take the hit on the, the energy conversion, but it's not ideal. And then I would say probably what until recently was the workhorse approach to get to the VUV and DPV region is parametric processes in bulk gases. So this is very similar um, to the parametric processes in crystals. We're using a Chi-3 nonlinearity rather than a Chi-2 one. Um, but uh, otherwise you're basically mixing multiple colors, usually just two colors inside a gas cell. So most of this setup is to generate a short pump source in the IR and a short source in the UV, so this in this case 266, and then you mix them in a gas cell and you can generate tunable pulses in the deep UV and vacuum ultraviolet region. Um, so this is very nice, It's it works. Um, it's hard to reach the very deep UV because the maximum photon energy you can get is double your pump photon energy. So if you start with 266, the maximum you can get is 133. Um, obviously, you could pump at a shorter wavelength, but it becomes more and more difficult to do that. Um, the bandwidth can be pretty good, so you can get quite short pulses, um, but it's, it's tricky to get sub-5 femtoseconds in this way, 
um, the efficiency is is moderate in this free space configuration, um, but it's really quite complex. Um, so again, if you've got one uh, fundamental science target that you want to hit, then it's probably worth the effort. Um, but it's not going to be a really widespread utility like tool that you can use uh, routinely. So what I'm going to talk about today is to do nonlinear optics in gases, but inside hollow fibers. Um, here's a picture of one example from from my lab um, of one setup. I'll show you some more later. Um, and the basic idea is we just we have a hollow fiber. We fill it with gas. We put our pulses in and by tuning the gas pressure, the core size and the pump pulses, we can determine what kind of uh, pulses that we get generated in this system. Um, and this system has some very nice features. It's easy to tune the dispersion and nonlinearity with the gas pressure. So it's not like a, a fixed system uh, where you have to refabricate every time if you want a different dispersion. Uh, if you want, say, for example, if you need a crystal, you have a different crystal cut. Here we can just tune the gas pressure. Um, and it's transparent from the X-ray to the mid infrared, right? So we can really generate very high energy photons at short wavelengths, or we can go into the mid infrared as well. So using these fibers for ultra fast nonlinear optics uh, was introduced um, by Nisali and, and, and co-workers back in 1996. I cannot emphasize enough how important this development was uh, for the progress in ultra fast science and ultra fast nonlinear optics. It's really foundational to all of the work that I do, but also all of the work that pretty much anyone does in ultra fast labs and atto science labs, right? Being able to compress pulses uh, down to a few cycles um, is absolutely critical for all of that work. And it's done very beautifully simply by uh, taking the hollow capillary fiber filling it with gas, you send the pulse in and we just get spectral broadening in the first fiber. So we're just using cell phase modulation based on the instantaneous Kerr effect or, or instantaneous refractive index. This broadens our spectrum and then outside of the fiber, we can use chirped mirrors or any other kind of dispersive delay line, but chirped mirrors give us the broadest bandwidth and the best control. And you can generate these short pulses in the near infrared spectral region. OK, and the question is, how can we extend this technology in order to get to the UV region um, and also to get shorter pulses? So to get to the UV region, we need to work on some kind of frequency conversion process. This is what I'll talk about most of the second half of my talk um, to get shorter pulses. This system is basically limited by the bandwidth of the mirrors. OK, and as Rothio mentioned in her talk this morning, the people have constructed uh, systems called light wave synthesizers, which are essentially this, but splitting up the output spectrum and combining it um, using multiple sets of chirped mirrors so that you can get a broader bandwidth than you can get with just a single set of chirped mirrors. Um, so that works really well. It's very elaborate. Um, and what I'm going to show you is a way of actually compressing the pulses in the fiber itself so that we don't need any chirp mirrors at all. And in that way, we managed to compress these pulses down to about one femtosecond. But before I get on to that, I just want to briefly mention that we are working on a different topic. I'm not going to talk any more about it today, but I wanted to highlight it because it kind of fitted in with the descriptions of the other systems that I mentioned um, earlier. And that is that you can also do parametric processes in the gas filled hollow fibers. So just to illustrate again, if we put in a pump pulse and we seed at some longer wavelength, um, uh, lower frequency uh, seed, then you can generate an idler pulse in the VUV or in the DPUV spectral region. Um, this technique was introduced by Durfee back in 1997. So it's a pretty established technique um, and we've been working on it in the last few years. Um, and it has a few nice features. So you can make these sources tunable within some limited spectral range. So you're limited a bit by the phase matching and the tunability of your seed pulse. So if you can tune your seed pulse, then you can also tune your idler pulse. Um, and you can also get a bit more tunability through the nonlinear dynamics. Um, it can be extremely efficient. So we have achieved over 50% conversion to the deep UV using this technique, um, so far generating 70 microjoules. And this can readily be scaled. Um, so this is the main advantage of this process is you can really get very high conversion efficiency. 
but you can also get quite good bandwidth and as in um, some frequency generation you can also get conversion of the chirp and so you can compensate that and get quite short pulses in the deep uv and vuv as well um, the only downside is because it's pumped by multiple frequencies again you've got the timing and uh, issues that come with a slightly more complex setup so i'm not going to talk about more about that today but I think it's important to be aware that you can do parametric processes in the gas filled hollow fibers and that this is actually quite an interesting approach um, which could could be very useful in the future so what i am going to talk about from now on is about soliton dynamics in capillary fibers and a simple way to think about these soliton dynamics is to say that we're taking the nonlinearity that we already have been using in the gas filled fibers um, as well established in these SPM based pulse compressors, but rather than having chirp mirrors outside the fiber to compensate the dispersion, we actually include or we make we design the system and optimize the system so that the dispersion becomes relevant inside the waveguide. And by doing this, we can get some very, very nice features. So the first and most obvious one is that we can compress the pulses um, through something called soliton effect self-compression. I'll describe a bit more detail in a moment. And by doing this, we can generate sub-cycle pulses with just one femtosecond in duration in the near infrared um, and a few femtoseconds um, towards the mid infrared. Um, so this is, these are extremely short pulses, um, close to record pulse durations. Um, we can do it with quite high peak power and uh, these are quite interesting for driving um, some ultra-fast nonlinear optics. But the other thing we can do is we can generate these tunable VUV pulses and deep UV pulses. Um, and we've managed to tune these down to about 100 nanometers in this fiber system, all the way up uh, to the visible and near infrared spectral region. These pulses can be very short, around about a few femtoseconds and we can convert them with reasonably high efficiency about 10 percent which means that we can get about 10 microjoules in our standard parameters in the deep and vuv uh, and this can be scaled to the multiple hundreds of microjoule level um, in the future so that's an overview of what i'm going to tell you about but i'm going to dive in a little bit more about the physics of where this comes from so first of all a good question is what what is a soliton and where do, what's this all about Okay, so solitons, I, I like to tell this story because it's quite interesting that solitons actually were discovered in the Union Canal between Edinburgh and Glasgow, which is about 500 meters from uh, where my laboratory is in Heriot Watt University. So this canal that's depicted in this figure um, was, was where the first soliton was observed, um, and it's right next to my lab. Um, so this is uh, John Scott Russell, and he was doing experiments on how to make canal barges travel more quickly on a canal. Okay, and in 1834, you got to remember that canal boats were actually the fastest means of communication uh, between cities, um, certainly in Edinburgh at the time. So this is pre-trains, um, and this, they, they were faster than horse-drawn carts, especially if you had significant cargo. Um, and so what he was doing is he was uh, tying canal boats to a pulley system, which was then pulled by galloping horses. And he was designing the hull of the boat so that it was starting to aquaplane. Um, so this was actually pretty interesting technology at the time, aquaplaning canal boats to uh, speed up uh, transmission between cities. Um, but sometimes the best experiments uh, are ones that go wrong. And this one went wrong. And this was because the rope snapped and uh, the boat suddenly stopped. Um, and then he writes, uh, not so the mass of water in the channel, which it had put in motion, a large solitary progressive wave. Um, and usually at this point, people would just get grumpy, go and have a cup of tea and say, right, we'll restart the experiment. But John Scott Russell instead jumped on the back of his horse and followed this solitary wave for miles and miles down the canal, observing the fact that it just kept going and it didn't disperse, it didn't change in shape. Um, and then being slightly crazy um, as he was, he actually then dedicated the rest of his career to these waves rather than to the aquaplaning canal boats. He actually built a water tank in his back garden and spent years studying them. So um, a lot of passion there and it's yielded great results because it's basically fundamental to all sorts of uh, research 
these days. So this is the canal path where it was demonstrated and this is part of where I cycle to work sometimes. Um, and there's a little plaque here next to the bridge in Herit Wad. So if you ever visit, which I encourage you to do, then um, you can come and see where the first soliton was generated. And just by a bit more history, um, I won't bore you forever with these ancient history slides, but this in 1995 was a recreation of the canal of the soliton on what's now called the John Scott Russell Aqueduct. Uh, by members of Harriet Watt University. So. so here is a water tank demonstration of what this looks like. If I can get the video to play. Um, this is a video by um, Christoph Fino. It's absolutely brilliant. And it uh, basically, sorry about the soundtrack. Um, <laughs> So you can see that this is a solitary wave that's propagating in this water tank. It has a set squared, profile, set squared shape profile and it basically propagates without dispersing as it goes up and down through this tank. Um, it doesn't spread out, um, it doesn't attenuate, it's very well created and it's, it keeps this shape. And this is an example of a soliton as a water wave and it's the sort of soliton that John Scott Russell would have observed uh, in the canal. So if we get back to nonlinear optics and how this applies um, to hollow waveguides and ultra short pulses, um, I just want to uh, briefly explain a little bit of where this comes from. So um, as you all are very well aware, you get your usual quantum mechanics, um, at least from one picture can be described by the Schrodinger equation. Um, and the key point here is you have your potential here, which is some externally defined potential. And the soliton solutions in hollow waveguides in any kind of optical fiber um, and also in plasmas, uh, in fact, are described by what's known as the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which is exactly the same equation, except rather than having an externally defined potential, um, the potential is defined by the pulse itself. So it's a nonlinear uh, Schrodinger equation, and that's what allows the self trapping or soliton solutions. Um, and the two important terms here, uh, so these parameters, are, this is written in time, but when we're talking about fibers, this will be position uh, uh, through the fiber. Um, the two important terms are dispersion and nonlinearity. Okay. And by combining these, you can get the soliton solution. So this is what happens if we combine them for a set shaped pulse such that they balance perfectly. Okay, so we've got dispersion term. So anomalous dispersion leads to a down chirp of the pulse uh, with time, so low frequencies lag. Whereas this term here, which gives rise to self phase modulation, uh, puts the low frequencies towards the front of the pulse. And these two can be balanced for a specific pulse shape. And you can see here that the pulse itself doesn't change as it propagates through the fiber. So this is very boring. This is called a fundamental soliton. The pulse just doesn't change at all. However, if you turn up the strength of the nonlinearity, um, then you get these beautiful periodic evolutions. So if we start off with n equals two, then initially the cell phase modulation dominates. We get a little bit more spectral broadening than we would have done originally. And then the dispersion becomes more and more important. And because the anomalous dispersion balances the chirp induced by the cell phase modulation, you actually get a pulse compression. Okay, and if you turn up the soliton order, for example, now n equals six, this is when the nonlinearity is much stronger than the dispersion. You get this beautiful periodic evolution in time where you get these spikes and then this splitting of the pulse and then this whole thing yeah, evolves back to its initial state. So these soliton dynamics are essentially just an academic curiosity because you never see this in reality. And that is because these equation, this equation doesn't apply to a physical system we have higher order terms, we have higher order dispersion, we have higher order nonlinearities like self steepening or uh, other effects such as the Raman scattering and this breaks up the soliton evolution. What we do usually see though is this initial compression process. So we're starting with a longish pulse and as you propagate through the initial stages of the fiber, um, you get this initial compression to this spike and this is what is soliton effect compression okay and I, will, I can show you um, what happens if we include the higher order terms we start off with our uh, shortish pulse uh, 
but it gets much, much shorter. It generates this spike. And then after this spike, we get what's called soliton fission and the whole thing breaks up into all of these structures. Okay, and this happens in real systems. This isn't just an academic curiosity. And it is this initial self compression which gives rise to our extremely short pulses. This is how we generate one femtosecond pulses. And then it is this breakup which gives rise to our deep and vacuum ultraviolet generation. So we explore these in hollow fibers, gas filled hollow fibers, but soliton dynamics have been observed for over 40 years in optical fiber systems. Um, in conventional optical fibers, there was for a while attempts to use them for telecoms. These have failed um, for some interesting reasons. Um, then in solid core microstructured fibers, and then I spent about 10 years working on hollow core uh, anti-resonant uh, microstructured fibers, where which have some very nice guidance properties and um, which can be used for these dynamics. And, and now we're working in the capillary systems. Um, so, as I said, in uh, Philip Russell's group at the Max Planck Institute for Science of Light in, in Erlangen in Germany, um, we generated a lot of different light sources using these hollow, um, hollow anti-resin microstructured fibers. Um, however, we wanted to scale, or I wanted to scale the energy and the intensity a little bit higher than what you can obtain in these fibers, which is basically limited by the breakdown of the gas. It's not limited by the fiber, it's just limited by the fact that if, as you turn up the power, your intensity scales, and at some point your intensity is too high for the helium inside the fiber, and therefore you can't uh, scale it anymore, you just ionize the gas. Um, so the way to do that is to increase the core radius, which means our power can go up um, as, a, as the core radius squared um, whilst maintaining the intensity. Um, and so we can do soliton dynamics in capillaries. We can get higher power and energy. There are some other advantages. We don't have the resonances which arise due to the microstructure here, which means that we've got better deep UV and vacuum ultraviolet transmission and the dynamics are a little bit cleaner. Um, However, it was not at all obvious that we could generate these soliton dynamics in these capillaries. And this was actually the main topic of my ERC starting grant was to demonstrate that this could work. So it was quite a major project to show that this was possible. Capillaries have two key downsides, right? One is that they have absolutely terrible bend loss. In fact, they're terrible waveguides in general, right? They're only good over short lengths. Um, but they also have extremely bad bend loss. So the fibers have to be perfectly straight. Um, and secondly, they're no good if you want to work at low energy because of course you can't have very small cores because the loss gets very high. Um, so if you want low energy and long fibers, then I would suggest that photonic crystal fibers, uh, especially these anti-resonant guiding ones are the way to go. So before getting into the details of what we've been doing, I just want to, it emphasized the importance of dispersion, okay? Because in uh, gas-filled hollow capillary systems had been used for 20 years or more um, you, without really using the dispersion inside the fibers because the dispersion was very weak. And the reason dispersion is weak is because with large core sizes, you have weak group velocity dispersion. And with the sort of pulse durations people were putting in, um, you're not really getting much of a dispersive effect. Um, and so you would, you know, this is just a comparison to show you how important dispersion is if you get the parameters right. So what we're doing here is just showing you uh, propagation dynamics of a pulse uh, with these parameters, 10 femtoseconds, 75 microjoules, um, in a large core um, with this pressure in argon. And if we keep the intensity length product the same, this is the B integral, right? So if we keep the nonlinearity the same, you know, in a lot of systems, we then think, well, if we keep the nonlinearity the same, the total B integral the same, we should get a similar spectral broadening. Um, but that ignores dispersion. If we keep it the same, but we tune the dispersion by using a smaller core and a lower gas pressure, um, as I say, we're keeping the intensity, nonlinearity, and the length the same, then we get totally different results because we've accessed the anomalous dispersion regime. And we are accessing now the solid on self compression dynamics and the generation of what's called a dispersive wave, which is our route to getting uh, to the ultraviolet. So how do we get those dynamics um, and how do we capture them in a capillary? So here are the two scaling rules which are most important. First is this fission length. This is the length 
of fiber that you need to get to this point where you get this very, very short spike. So this depends on these parameters. A is the core radius of the capillary. Tau here is the duration of the pump pulse, the wavelength cubed, and the intensity. Now, the intensity is usually capped at what you can handle in the gas you're using. So we typically use helium. The intensity at the input is typically capped at about 10 to the 14 watts per centimeter squared. So if you want to get a short fission length, then this implies you want to use a smaller core size. OK, but the problem is that in capillaries, the loss, this is the loss length. So this is inverse of the actual loss. The loss scales terribly with core size. If we put in very small cores, the loss is so strong that we just don't see anything coming out. This is where photonic crystal fibers come in because they have very low loss, even for very small core sizes. But if we're wanting to scale the energy and the intensity, we need to use larger cores and therefore we have to deal with this in a different way. And the way to deal with this is to go to larger core sizes and shorter pulses. Okay, so the shorter pulses reduces this and the larger core size allows us to not suffer from the loss. The loss scales with A cubed, the dispersion scales with A squared. And so you can always win in terms of getting soliton dynamics by going to larger cores because the loss scales much more quickly. Um, but you still end up needing quite a long fiber. And the problem is, as I mentioned before, the fibers have terrible bend loss. So how do we get around this? Okay, um, so just to be clear here, this is the bend loss of the capillary and this is the bend radius. And you can see that as as the the loss scales quite badly as you as you in, increase, sorry, decrease the bend radius. So the way to overcome this is to make use of stretched hollow fibers. Um, and this was a technique developed by Tamash Naj and co-workers um, in 2008. And I would say it's a seminal contribution to the field because it absolutely transforms what can be achieved with the hollow capillary system. Okay. And the basic idea is that by using a flexible hollow capillary and stretching it by applying a tension to each end, you can get a bend radius that's greater than one kilometer quite easily just by tightening just with not too much force um, and therefore this term can be eliminated and you can get essentially an ideal waveguide um, and we routinely get um, theoretical limited transmission through these systems at the limit of what is uh, the theoretical um, estimates for these types of fibers so this is an experimental setup finally. So we, uh, in the first demonstration that we did for this technique, we started with our 30 femtosecond TISAF pulses. We compressed them through a more or less conventional compressor. This was still a stretched capillary 1.7 meters long, but that was just to keep the, the any distortions due to uh, ionization under control. So we broadened the pulse due to SPM. We compress it using chirp mirrors. This is a conventional pulse compressor. We then couple it into a second stage where we've now got much shorter pulses, uh, six to 30 femtoseconds, and we use a much longer fiber, about three meters long with a 250 micron uh, core diameter. And it is in that second stage where we get soliton dynamics. Now, developing the theory behind this and getting the funding to do this and building the setup was took many, many years um, and was a, a, a passion that drove me um, in through some quite hard times. Um, this is what it looked like uh, when we got it running. Um, this is a little bit evolved and, and how, how it looks in the lab. Um, and when we actually got it working, um, this is what I looked like. Um, so please excuse the lack of laser safety and general um, inappropriateness. And this is not a very flattering photo, but I just wanted to include it because it illustrates, I think, hope you can see the genuine excitement when you see something in the lab for the first time that you've been working so hard to achieve um, and suddenly then it's working and it's it's really a fabulous feeling. Um, I'm sure many of you have felt this, but uh, uh, I really think it's important to emphasize that when you present results in a presentation like this, it's not just, it's a human experience. It's not just the technical results that we're trying to get across, but I want to emphasize that it's really something that's, you know, a very human process and without that passion um, you will not succeed at this so you've really got to follow what you care and, and enjoy doing so here are the first results the first official results without the uh, crazy photograph so we compressed um, uh, 
pump pulses were 10 femtoseconds and we managed to compress these down to about 1.2 femtoseconds. So this orange curve here is the measured pulse and the blue curve is the pulse that we generate from our numerical modeling. Um, so you get really good agreement. These are really exceptionally short pulses. If you look at the electric field carrier within that pulse structure, it's about 400 attoseconds. Okay, so these are optical attosecond pulses, still centered in the near infrared spectral region, but with sub femtosecond duration. Um, and the generator, we generated them through this self compression dynamics, but actually most of the hard work is measuring them, right? So measuring a 1.2 femtosecond pulse is really a big challenge. Um, and we developed this tychographic polarization gated frog technique to do that. I haven't got time to talk about it. The details are in this paper, um, but it lets you measure, uh, uh, characterize a pulse over about three octave spectral bandwidth, um, which is what you need to measure such a short pulse. This technique also works in the infrared. So if you go back to our scaling rules, um, you can see that the loss in this case, in this case, it's the opposite to loss. The loss um, at longer wavelengths gets worse, right? So the loss length gets shorter as the wavelength gets bigger, but the fission length, the, the length over which the soliton dynamics occur gets shorter much more quickly. So it's by the cube rather than by the square. So it's easier to get self-compression at longer wavelengths. Um, so we did this by pumping these fibers with 30 femtoseconds from our OPA system at 1800 nanometers, um, using a 2.5 meter fiber with, with 450 micron diameter core. Um, and by uh, combining those elements, um, we put it into our hollow capillary and we characterize the output with a some frequency generation frog system, which is what most of this setup is here. So we take the output pulses, pass them through a BBO, and at the same time, we're crossing that beam with uh, 810 nanometer pulse filtered from our OPA um, inside this crystal. And if the nice thing about working in the infrared is you can get using BBO, you can get this phase matching, which goes from all the way from the UV all the way to the infrared. So it's an extraordinarily broad and flat phase matching, um, which enables us just to directly measure the spectrogram of, of the pulses coming out. And using this technique, we generated two femtosecond pulses um, with this spectrum. So the central frequency, the centroid of this spectrum is at about 1400 nanometers. Um, so this is a really interesting driver for ATO science because it's extremely short, by far world record pulse duration with pretty good energy and intensity, which can quite easily be scaled. Um, and this is a great driver for, for generating isolated ATO seconds. Uh, in the soft X-ray region. This is something that we're working towards. And here, just to show you, these are the measured pulse compression shapes of the pulse as it compresses. So this is the input pulse, and you can see that as we turn up the energy, the pulse just naturally compresses. We've got no dispersive optics uh, leading to the pulse com com compression here. So I've used up more than half of my time and I haven't yet talked about the ultraviolet. So now I'm going to do that. But the reason I haven't yet talked about it is because the ultraviolet generation is intrinsically linked to this self-compression process. So I wanted to illustrate that first. So how do we generate ultraviolet pulses through these soliton dynamics? The way we do that is by recognizing that we don't have the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, but we have some perturbations to it. And the most important perturbation is third order dispersion, okay? And this was recognized back in 1986 in conventional optical fibers. Here you're seeing the spectrum at the output of a fiber without third order dispersion. If you include third order dispersion, you get a slightly distorted spectrum with this little peak here, okay? So again, the importance of, you know, results that originally didn't look very remarkable, seems like a small effect. Um, it took years for attention to be paid to these sorts of results, but now it's fundamental to at least everything that I do, okay? So this spike here is called a resonant dispersive wave, and this is how we generate the ultraviolet light. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a spectrogram simulation of a pulse propagating through a hollow fiber. So this is the pump pulse. Um, on this axis, we have time, and on this axis, we have frequency. And as the pulse propagates through the fiber, you'll see it self-compress, build up a shock wave, and emit this resonant dispersive wave. So here goes. So this is 
uh, the pulse is compressing in time, so it's getting shorter on this axis and it's broadening on the frequency axis. You then get this shock wave that's generated. This is due to self-steepening. And then at a certain frequency, we get this resonant dispersive wave emitted. So this frequency here depends on a phase matching condition at which energy is tunneled from the soliton to the dispersive wave. And we get this quite nice pulse isolated at a very high frequency. Here are experimental spectrograms, experimentally measured. Um, you can see the details in this paper here that show this process going on in a hollow capillary fiber. So we start with our infrared pump pulse, 30 femtoseconds, um, uh, with uh, the bandwidth coming out of our OPA. And as the energy is turned up, you can see that this pulse compresses in time, right? So on this axis, it's shorter um, and it gets broader in spectrum. And then at a certain resonant frequency, we emit this resonant dispersive wave. And this is our tunable pulse in the, uh, in this case, in the visible, this is at about 500 nanometers so that it fits into our pulse characterization system. So the phase matching condition is basically that which matches the linear dispersion of the waveguide plus filling gas to that of the soliton. And solitons have a peculiar phase profile because they don't chirp, right? Because they're the balance between nonlinearity and dispersion, they don't experience group velocity dispersion. And so they basically don't have these higher order terms of dispersion. And so that means that some higher frequency or shorter wavelength from your soliton, in this case, we're pumping at 800, uh, we get a point where the soliton phase matches with the linear dispersive waves. And as we turn up the gas pressure, this crossing point shifts. And as we turn up the power, the crossing point shifts in the opposite direction. So by controlling the pressure and the power, we can control the location that this resonant dispersive wave is emitted. And here are experimentally measured spectra of where we did this in the same system that we did this one femtosecond pulse generation pumping at 800. So we pump with 10, fem 10 femtoseconds, and we tune the gas pressure and the energy, and we can generate these tunable dispersive waves down to about 105 nanometers, and we can tune it all the way up continuously in a single system all the way up to 350 nanometers, right? And that covers the whole DPUV region and the vacuum ultraviolet region. Okay, so this is a very nice source of tunable pulses. Okay, these are these this you could just dial up exactly what pulse you want for whatever experiment that you're planning to do. The energy is pretty good. Remember, these were the very first results. So there have been some improvements since then. Um, but over most of the band from about 150 nanometers upwards, we've got more than 10 microjoules. OK, and then in the tailing end here down in the very deep VUV, the energy decreases. But still at 105 nanometers, we still had more than a microjoule. OK, and this was when pumping with a few hundred microjoules. You can scale the whole system up and get much more energy from it if, if you need to. Um, but these energies are already sufficient for most uh, spectroscopy experiments. Um, the conversion efficiency at its peak is about 15%. Um, and the pulse duration, which I'll come to a bit later, but the initial pulse duration we estimated from numerical simulations is of the order of one to three femtoseconds, depending on where you are across this spectrum. And furthermore, the beam profile is basically perfect because these pulses are generated, they're only phase matched in the fundamental mode of the waveguide. So they're generated in the fundamental mode of the hollow capillary, which means that's where, what comes out of the fiber. So we have a really perfect mode coming out across this UV range. So again, we can pump at 1800 nanometers in the infrared. And in that case, the whole system shifts to longer wavelengths. And so we can get tunable pulses across the deep UV visible range and near ultraviolet. So again, single system, we've just tuned it all the way across. These are experimental results. And these are some beautiful photographs of what it looks like as you tune across the visible. So the big advantage of working in the visible is you can get these beautiful pictures. Um, but uh, this again is also a, a, a pretty interesting source um, for lots of experiments. And I haven't got time to go in all of the details, but depending on the core size, you can generate 20 microjoules across this whole range, or you can generate slightly lower energies in a smaller core, um, but you can extend to slightly shorter wavelengths. This just depends on, on how much energy you have to get high enough order solitons to generate the short wavelengths. Um, so both of these could be extended to the VUV region as well.
So one of the problems with generating ultra short pulses in the vacuum ultraviolet in a gas system is then you need to deliver these to vacuum because if you've got a pulse at 130 nanometers, which is one femtosecond long, you can't really do anything with it before you chirp it into becoming a really long pulse. So we need delivery to vacuum, okay? And we need to make sure that the pulses coming out aren't too chirped. And the way to do this is to use a pressure gradient, a technique widely established in conventional hollow fiber compressors. Um, so you just seal the fiber into the gas cells in this case, um, rather than letting the fiber run through a tube, and then you can have different pressure at the input and output. Um, and if you work out, if you do the analysis, you can show that the pressure changes throughout the fiber following these curves here, which are described by these equations. Okay, so we the pressure is changing throughout the fiber. So one advantage is that we get delivery to vacuum. If we put the zero pressure at the output, that means we can deliver directly to our target experiment. Um, but it also means we can control the dynamics inside the fiber as well. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I think I'm running out of time and I want to cover a couple of other topics as well. Um, but the basic point is that if you follow the same scaling where you get essentially the same B integral, then surprisingly, despite the fact that this is a very dynamical process, you get very similar output. So your energy required for fission is similar. This is when the dispersive wave first emerges and the wavelength that you generate is also similar. There are subtleties in the dynamics as the energy changes uh, in a gradient system, um, which you can read about in this paper here if you want to. Um, but uh, the, the overall conclusion is that spectrally we get very similar results. But the important thing is that we have some advantages in the time domain. So first I show you here a comparison between experiment and simulation just to prove to you that our simulations are basically excellent, right? We get extremely good agreement between experiment and simulation despite these dynamics being really quite uh, complicated. And therefore, we can use the, the simulated pulse dynamics to illustrate an important point, which is that in the decreasing gradient, as we increase the energy, the pulse coming out of the fiber in vacuum stays fairly close to its Fourier transform limit, around about twice the Fourier transform limit of the pulse, which means we can deliver these two femtosecond pulses into vacuum and to an experiment. Whereas if we have constant pressure, even if we don't include the window, which we would have to use in such a system, the pulse as, it, as you increase the energy chirps. And this is simply because you're generating it earlier in the fiber and it then propagates through the rest of the gas. And at that point, the gas is normally dispersive. And so we just get dispersion of our UV pulse. Whereas in the pressure gradient, we can compensate for that and we don't get the dispersion of the UV pulse. This has been experimentally observed um, in hollow core photonic crystal fibers where similar dynamics were, were shown and in a pressure gradient system generating the deep UV radiation we were getting three femtosecond pulses tunable across that region. So this definitely works. We haven't fully characterized it yet in the hollow capillary system. So one other thing that we have tried recently is to show that we can transfer polarization using this technique. Okay, so all of the dynamics I've explained are basically uh, transparent to polarization. So if you put in linear polarization or circular polarization, or even uh, more exotic things like radial vector beams, you can get uh, the complete transfer of these to the ultraviolet. So here we're pumping, we simply changed our setup. All we did was put in a quarter wave plate so that we're pumping with circularly polarized pulses and then the same dynamics observed. So it's another one of our favorite tuning curves where we can show that we can tune across the deep UV um, using our circularly polarized pulses. And in each case here, we've characterized the polarization. You can see it's not perfect, but we've got pretty good ellipticity in every single, uh, at every single wavelength. And this is very useful, for example, for circular dichroism studies. Um, the other interesting insight from the polarization results is that if you scale the energy appropriately, essentially by three halves, then you get very similar dynamics. So this is a, maybe a bit too much data, but here we're showing different pressures and we're comparing the circular and linear polarization results. The only difference being that in circular polarization, we have three halves of the energy that we have in the linear polarization case. 
and it's really spookily good, right? It really agrees very well in every case from very low pressure to much higher pressure. Um, so the dynamics are completely transparent to the polarization. And finally, I want to mention about timing and energy stability. So one of the issues with this technique is that it's highly nonlinear and dynamical. Okay, so you can imagine that there's a very strong dependence of the VUV or deep UV pulse structure or wavelength on the pump pulses themselves, on the instabilities of the pump pulses themselves. Um, so we have now analyzed this numerically. You can read about it in this archive paper. Um, and our conclusion so far is that this is something you have to pay attention to, but you can actually get some very nice results. So firstly, in terms of temporal stability, we found that the timing jitter of our UV pulses of the order of about 100 at a second. And that's for pump and energy fluctuations of more than 1%, okay? So even if you've got quite a noisy pump laser, our pump laser's uh, sub 0.1, uh, percent energy fluctuations but if you even if you have quite a noisy one at one percent you still only have about 100 after seconds timing jitter so that's sufficient for most experiments secondly if you get the parameters right you can actually reduce the energy noise um, of the dispersive wave in the uv um, because of some nonlinear gain saturation effect so you can actually get uh, very very low noise in terms of the spectral shape and and energy um, if you work in the regime where the process is saturated. Um, so this is very encouraging that these sources can be really used um, nicely for, for experiments, uh, which have very demanding requirements on stability. And finally, I just want to highlight the fact that these dynamics are scalable. So the results I've shown you have been based essentially on this system here a 250 micron diameter capillary about three meters long with about half a millijoule of pump energy. They can be scaled down. We've shown that in capillaries and also they can be scaled right down to the six microjoule level if you use photonic crystal fibers. Um, so that's good if you want to do very high rep rate, low energy sources. But they can also be scaled up um, and you can scale them up to the terawatt level or higher. So you can get one femtosecond pulses with a terawatt um, and you can get 300 gigawatt pulses in the deep and vacuum ultraviolet. And this is the topic of my ERC consolidator grant, which starts in the summer, uh, where we're gonna be looking at using these extremely short high intensity pulses to drive relativistic nonlinear optics. So to summarize, um, I've shown you how we can get high energy tunable pulses across the vacuum ultraviolet and near infrared by using these soliton dynamics in a hollow capillary. Um, we can get really short pulses, easily tunable across this range, and we can deliver them in vacuum without chirp um, and control their polarization. And we can also use this same soliton dynamics to generate these optical attosecond pulses, these sub-cycle pulses in the near and mid-infrared spectral region um, for driving, for, exa for example, high harmonic generation for soft X-ray attosecond experiments. So that's what I've shown. Um, I would like to mention that we are very happy to collaborate on this technique. There's a lot of subtleties involved in doing this. So um, I want to spread this technology as widely as possible because it's good for us if people use the research that we do. Um, so if you need these tunable UV sources or these compression pul compressed pulses in the infrared, um, we're very happy to count collaborate. Um, we can help optimize the dynamics for different applications. Um, we've got a very established modeling code for that. And we can even provide kits of equipment on, to help build the stretched fiber setup and to optimize it for different applications. So get in touch if you're interested in using it uh, for your research. And very finally, um, I have quite a few open positions in my group. So if you feel like moving to Scotland and to Edinburgh, which is the best city in the world, um, and joining our, our group and working on a whole range of different topics, then please get in touch. We're working with collaborators on lots of different experiments, applying these sources. Um, and then, as I said, we've got a new ERC consolidator grant where we're looking at scaling these dynamics to the terawatt level and using them to drive relativistic nonlinear optics. It's a slightly crazy project, but it should be quite a lot of fun. And we also have industrial uh, projects with, with some very large uh, semiconductor companies uh, to industrialize some of these techniques. 
Um, so please get in touch if any of that uh, is interesting to you. Um, and other than that, I'm here to answer your questions. <laughs>